Good evening. I'm delighted to be able to welcome you here this evening to the University Museum of Natural History to listen to Professor Paul Collier speak about the issues he addresses in his most recent book, The Bottom Billion, which I commend to all of you. I'm especially pleased to welcome on your behalf Professor Collier. I shall say a little, little more about Professor Collier in a moment, but first I should like to pay tribute to the James Martin 21st Century School and to its director, Dr Ian Golden, for mounting another in this remarkable lecture series. As many of you may know, the 21st Century School had its genesis in the vision and generosity of Dr James Martin, an alumnus of Keeble College. Dr Martin provided an endowment of 100 million US dollars uh, three years ago, to found a school in Oxford that would foster new thinking, much of it interdisciplinary, about the pressing issues that face the world in the current century. There are currently 10 institutes within the school, researching areas as diverse as ageing, human infection, global climate change, ethics and migration, to mention but five of them. Today's lecture follows on from two recent and important lectures. The first, by Sir Nicholas Stern on the economics of climate change, and the second by Dr. Craig Venter on genomic research. These two lectures, and the third in the series today, are aimed squarely at the challenges that the 21st Century School was established to research and consider. Paul Collier is Professor of Economics here at the University and is Director of the Centre for the Study of African Economies, Previously, he has served as director of the Development Research Group at the World Bank and was senior advisor to the Government's Commission on Africa. His research, past and present, has focused on addressing the developmental challenges that face low-income countries. These include the economics of conflict and governance with a strong focus as well on the effects of aid, exchange rate and trade policies. He is here this evening to tell us about the main themes of his book, The Bottom Billion, which brings together much of his past research and seeks to disentangle the causes of state failure in the poorest 50 to 60 nations whose populations constitute the bottom billion. Many of you will have read the book already, so I will not now attempt to say anything further about the subject matter. But I should express that Professor Collier pre presents a dramatic challenge to conventional development thinking, drawing on economic theory, statistical analysis, and his own deep knowledge and experience gained from working in the countries whose populations constitute the bottom billion. I know we're all enormously grateful to Professor Collier for the work he does, but also for being with us here this evening. So please welcome him. Um, I'm going to talk about the bottom billion, and uh, the bottom billion is, um, is a bestseller. Um, in fact, at one stage, it even pushed um, the greatest thoughts of uh, Ronald Reagan out of the Amazon top ten um, book list. Um, now, I'm an economist, and economists don't write bestsellers. Um, in fact, in order to write a bestseller, I, um, I made The Bottom Billion a book that anybody could read. It's not technical, and it's even supposed to be fun. Right? Now, that actually meant that I broke the oath that all professional economists take uh, upon taking up our appointments um, to make sure that whatever we write is incomprehensible. Um, <laughs> thereby uh, demonstrating what a, how very clever we must be in order to be economists. Um, and I didn't break that oath lightly, um, and eventually I'm going to tell you why I broke it. It was purposive. Um, in fact, some of you may have seen the, the flyer that initially advertised this lecture. And, um, the initial flyer wasn't called... Um, why the poorest countries are failing, it was called, I think, why humans are failing. Um, and the, the, the word human and economic economists just don't go together. And so, sure enough, this was actually a mistake. Um, 
but it was in a sense an inspired mistake uh, because the, the eventual message of this lecture when I get towards the end is that indeed humans are failing um, and the humans that have been failing are you and people like you. Um, that's in fact why I wrote a book that had to be accessible. Um, but you'll see why uh, what you think matters eventually. So, let me turn to what the, the message of the bottom billion is. And I can't give it to you all, but I'm going to give you uh, some of the, the key moving parts and examples in each, each part. And it's a, the book is really in, in three parts. The first is a statement of the problem. And the second is a diagnosis of the problem. And the third turns to solutions. Uh, and let me start with a statement of the problem. And anybody working on development issues over the last decade kind of knows what the problem is. Um, the problem uh, is poverty, global poverty. And the challenge is to reduce global poverty. Now, um, that sounds so obvious um, that... Uh, it's difficult to, to tell an audience right from the start that I think that's a terrible misdefinition of the challenge that we are facing uh, in the future. Uh, so let me, let me get that right up front that I think defining the development challenge as a reduction of global poverty actually really confuses the issue. Let me start by saying that the reason we define uh, the development challenge as the reduction in global poverty does not actually come out of deep economic analysis. It came out of the political needs of the World Bank in the 1990s. And the, uh, the World Bank faced the following political problem. Uh, it had no friends. Um, uh, and that was because um, the political left was what the political left was really exercised by was redistribution within countries. It wanted equity. And what the political right really wanted was growth. By saying poverty reduction, that very cleverly papered over the cracks between these two positions. And the World Bank said poverty reduction, the left could hear poverty reduction through greater equity and redistribution, and the right could hear poverty reduction through growth. And so there was a possibility of building an alliance where the bank had some friends. So it was that political need which started us off on thinking of the development challenge as reducing global poverty. Now, once the bank's public relations department came up with that as the concept, and of course economists around the world decided this was something you could count. Right? And so there's now a whole industry counting global poverty. Right? Um, which is, I think, it has many absurdities in it. Um, but let me, let me now tell you, having, having said why we think global poverty is the development problem, let me say why it's uh, really confusing. In the process of tracking global poverty, we have missed the fact that the, the nature of the development challenge has changed fundamentally from what it was 40 years ago. When I started development economics, the developing world was a world of about 5 billion people in poor countries with a massive gap between them and the billion people in rich countries. And so the development challenge was how do you develop the 5 billion into the 1 billion? And now that's just not the right way of looking at the world. The count of global poverty counts across the 5 billion and says how many of them are below some absolute poverty threshold. So you get a lot of people in China, a lot of people in India, right? below the poverty threshold. What's actually happened over that last 30 to 40 years is that most of the populations in that 5 billion developing country population, most of them 
are now living in countries which are growing and growing at historically unprecedented rates. They're growing so fast that they're rapidly converging on the billion at the top. There's still a long way to go, but they're converging. Meanwhile, there's a billion people living in 50 to 60 little countries that got stuck, that haven't grown over the last 40 years. Basically, they've been stagnant. Now, that's produced a process of divergence and indeed accelerating divergence between this billion at the bottom and the next four billion. In the 1980s and 90s, the divergence averaged 5% a year. It's a massive rate of divergence. Cumulatively, by the millennium, the gap between the average person in the bottom billion and the average person in the next four had widened to five to one. That's before we start thinking about the billion rich. And so the fundamental problem for development, I feel, is not the reduction in global poverty. It's reversing divergence. In a world which is socially integrating, having a billion people at the bottom of society diverging is just going to be socially explosive. It is both a human tragedy for the billion at the bottom and socially explosive for the rest of us. And so the challenge is to, revert, to replace divergence with convergence. The billion at the bottom have got to catch up. And that's why talking about global poverty misses the point. Global poverty has actually been falling for the last 20 years, driven by first China and now India. Just as we cheer the reduction in global poverty, it misses this divergence. And of course, if the, if the bottom billion are basically being stagnant, looking at the absolute numbers of people in poverty kind of misses the point. If things are stagnant, by definition, in absolute terms, not much is happening. Maybe poverty goes up a bit, maybe it goes down a bit. The phenomenon is divergence. So there's the problem statement. And now we turn to diagnosis. Why have the billion at the bottom diverged from the rest of mankind at such an astounding rate? Why have they missed out on this process of unprecedented development? I argue that there's, there's no one explanation. Right? Uh, if you've got Jeff Sachs here instead of Paul Collier, he'd tell you um, that poverty is itself the trap. Right? And that's very neat. And you can build models in which poverty is indeed the trap. Um, but in a sense, it can't be right, because four billion people are living in countries which have really spectacularly escaped poverty. So I argue that the bottom billion are actually a bit like sort of Tolstoy's unhappy families. Those of you who've read your Tolstoy, right, that he says, well, happy families are all much of a muchness. There's really only one way to be happy, but there are many different ways to be unhappy. And I think the bottom billion are a bit like that. I come down to four processes, four distinct processes, which confine these countries to stagnation. And it's possible for a country to be in more than one of these processes or traps at the same time. I haven't got time in just 45 minutes to go through all those four traps. And so what I'm going to do is select just one. If you want to find, about, find out about the others, you read the book. Um, and uh, I think I'll choose um, a trap which is, uh, which is in a way very curious. It's the trap of being resource rich. Uh, and uh, that is having a, initially a low level of income but a lot of valuable natural resources. And you'd think, well, surely in a sense that must be good news. That must be an opportunity 
It's better to have valuable resources than not. Um, and sometimes that's right. But usually it's not. There's a thing called the resource curse. That is to say, you can, uh, despite the fact, or, or even because of the fact of these large resource endowments, you get stuck. Now, I've looked at that statistically, and uh, the first thing I did was to take the last 40 years and look at the relationship between commodity prices for the commodity exporting countries and their subsequent growth. And I used a fancy new econometric technique called co-integration, which allows you to look at both the short-run effects and the long-run effects. Right? Incidentally, I'm giving you the results of some new research, which is going to be in the next book, but not in this one. Right? Um, what, we, uh, what we found... And I, let me say, why I choose this as, I think, the single most important trap for present purposes is, of course, that globally we're in a massive commodity boom. And so a lot of the bottom billion countries are getting unprecedentedly large revenues from their export of resources. I've just flown in this morning from Zambia, which is exporting something around... $2 billion a year in, in copper exports. So it's massive. They're going through a copper boom. They went through one in the 1970s. Didn't do Zambia a whole lot of good. In fact, it's poorer now than it was then. It turns out, when you look at the whole global pattern, the relationship between commodity exporting and subsequent growth performance that you get a story where the short run looks very good. That is what we're seeing in the bottom billion at the moment. Growth rates in the last three or four years have gone up quite a lot. That's very good news, and it might be the bottom billion finally turning the corner. But what the econometrics shows is that that's going to happen as a short run response to any commodity the short run response, everything goes up. It's hunky dory. And how about the longer term effects? I've actually simulated the, uh, the, the effects of the current commodity booms if the global history of the last 40 years repeats itself, plays out again. And by 2010, everything will be up by about 10% relative to what would have happened otherwise. If you come back in 2025, instead of GDP being 10% above counterfactual, it will be 25% below counterfactual. That's the global pattern. In the short term, it's hunky-dory. In the long term, it's humpty-dumpty. You fall off a cliff. Now, it's not, it turns out it's not inevitable that you fall off a cliff. There are countries like Norway, where you go up in the short term, and you go up even further in the long term. What does it depend upon? So that's the next thing we looked at. And what we found was it depends upon initial levels of economic governance. There's a threshold level, and if you're above that threshold level of economic governance, there's no resource curse. You go up short term, up further in the long term. You're nowhere. The resource curse is entirely confined to countries below this threshold. So where's the threshold? Well, to take a, a neutral type of country, it's about the economic governance level of Portugal in the mid-1980s. Those of you from Portugal, I'm sorry, but in the mid-1980s, Portugal was not the star of European um, economic governance. Right? Um, but the question we've got to ask is, how does Portugal in the mid-1980s compare with 
uh, the bottom, gov economic governance in the bottom billion now? And the answer is, for most countries, it was a whole lot better. And so the prognosis is, if history repeats itself, the current booms are flattering the long-term prospects. Now, will history repeat itself? As an economist, I believe that behavior comes out of incentives, and incentives tend to come out of institutions. And there's one institution which is profoundly different in the bottom billion now from what it was in the 1970s when the last commodity booms played out. And that is, most of these countries have democratized. There was, thanks to the fall of the Soviet Union, a wave of democratization in the 90s. So is that the transformation in economic governance that we need? Yeah? So again, rather than just speculate, you can actually research this statistically. You can see whether democracy makes things better or worse in the how these resource revenues play out for growth. It turns out, unfortunately, democracy makes things even worse. Um, now, at that stage, the research got, you know, seemed so depressing that I was inclined to just suppress it. But, but instead, I thought, well, Democracy, what do we mean by democracy? And so I, I thought, well, there are really two rather different dimensions of, of, a, of a mature democracy. One is um, electoral competition, which is about how a government acquires power. That's a defining feature of democracy, but it's not the only defining feature. The other defining feature is checks and balances which limit how a government can use power. Right? And so I look to see, nowadays it's amazing, there are quantitative indices on both of these things, country by country. And of course, some countries have very strong electoral competition and not many checks and balances, and others, lots of checks and balances and not very strong electoral competition. And it turns out that uniquely with the resource-rich countries, electoral competition is actually really dysfunctional, whereas checks and balances are very helpful. If you've got strong enough checks and balances, democracy makes things better, not worse. Right? And so economic governance, we can nail down to checks and balances. Right? So do the uh, countries of the bottom billion that democratized have democracies with lots of checks and balances? Some do, not many. Right? One that does is Botswana. Strong checks and balances. Even the government of Botswana would admit that it, the electoral competition is quite sedate. Right? The government's never done anything as drastic as lose, but it's really constrained in how it can use power. And Botswana really harnessed its resource wealth, which was diamonds, for growth. It was the fastest growing country, not just in Africa, but in the world for many years. Unfortunately, that's not the norm. And there's a very simple reason for it. And that is that electoral competition, you can do elections almost anywhere. Iraq, Afghanistan, the middle of a war, elections, no problem, right? Why? Because the incentives for political parties to take part are overwhelming. It's the route to power. How about checks and balances? Elections are events. Checks and balances are processes. What's more, they're public goods. One thing economists know about public goods is they're going to be massively underprovided because nobody has an incentive to provide them. If everybody benefits, why should anybody bother? Checks and balances are even worse than that because there's only one group which definitely doesn't benefit from checks and balances, namely the people who've got the power. But they've got the power to put in the checks and balances or not. What we find is that systematically, whereas the resource-rich countries need very strong checks and balances, what they get is very weak ones. 
Indeed, even if they start with decent checks and balances, over time, the resource riches tend to erode the checks and balances. So there's the trap of resource wealth. It's a huge opportunity. It's a huge opportunity now for the bottom billion, an op a scale of opportunity without precedent. And I think we know what will determine whether it will produce the transformation which it, it's capable of doing. And that depends upon putting in place stronger checks and balances in these societies. And we also know that that process is going to prove very, very difficult. Because all the forces within these societies are going in the opposite direction. So that's an analysis of one of the traps. There are four traps. Then there's an analysis of globalization, which I'm just not going to have time to talk about. What I now want to turn to is the solutions. Just as the problem statement, it's not poverty, it's divergence, is an original thesis of the bottom billion, and the diagnosis that these, these four traps and a failure in the globalization process is unfortunately new, the message of the solutions is probably the newest. And the message of the solutions is, in a nutshell, it's not just about aid. In fact, it's not even primarily about aid. In the last couple of years, there's been this very theatrical uh, and polarized debate, the Bill and Jeff debate, <laughs> right, over whether aid is the solution or the problem. People keep asking me, where do I position myself in that debate? And the answer is, I chuck it in the dustbin, right? I think it's the wrong debate. Okay. Let me give you an example of what happened last time the rich world got serious about the challenge of development, and what the rich world did. And that will illustrate what the range of policies that we need happens to be. The last time the rich world got serious about development was in the late 1940s. What was the rich world? It was America. What was the development challenge? It was Europe. Why did America get serious about developing Europe in the late 1940s? because the alternatives looked horrendous. There was the Soviet Union gradually eating up the little fragile democracies of Europe. And what's more, the Soviet Union developed nuclear rockets aimed at America. And so America knew, my God, we have to get serious. Europe has to develop economically. That's the last time anybody got serious about a development problem. What did America do? Yes, there was an aid program. It was called Marshall Aid. Right? In that sense, I'm with Jeff. I think aid is part of the solution, not part of the problem. Though it's sometimes dysfunctional, in general, it's part of the solution. But what else did America do? apart from Marshall Aid? Well, one thing it did was it totally reversed its trade policy. You think what American trade policy was before the Second World War? It was massively protectionist. America totally tore that protectionist policy up. It decided it better integrate Europe into the then global economy, i.e. the American economy. And so it systematically liberalized its markets against Europe 
And it institutionalized that. It created the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade as an institutional lock-in mechanism to force that liberalization process. So, total reversal of trade policy. Anything else? Well, let's take security policy. Think what America, American security policy was before the Second World War. Remember? It was isolationist. Right? Forget the rest of the world. We've got an ocean between us, never mind. Them, right? What did America do after the Second World War? Well, there were more than 100,000 troops in Europe for more than 40 years. Right? A total reversal of security policy. And what else? Governance. Mutual governance. Sovereignty. How about that? Before the Second World War, American policy, very clear. Total individual sovereignty. I'll do what I like, you can do what you like. Yeah? National sovereignty in spades. Think what happened in Germany. After the Second World War, America sets up mutual governance support systems. It sets up the OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, and it encourages the formation of the European community both mutual governance support systems, countries reinforcing each other's governance. So that was the waterfront of policies. Aid, yes. Trade, yes. Security, yes. Governance, yes. That's still the waterfront. The details of how we use those policies to help the bottom billion are, of course, radically different. The bottom billion is not Europe in 1945. But ask yourself, is the problem of reversing the divergence of the bottom billion and achieving convergence, is that easier or harder than the problem of rebuilding Europe in the late 1940s? It seems to me self-evident that it's harder. And so we need to be at least as serious as America was then. When I say we, I mean especially we in Europe. Because effectively, we are America. And the Europe that was the Europe of the 1940s is now the bottom billion. And so first off, it's a challenge for us. It's our turn to play that role. So far, we're not doing so. Again, I have only time to take one example of that wide waterfront of policies. And I'm going to take the one that sounds the most feeble, the one that really sounds like motherhood and apple pie and pretty useless, and that is governance. And what I want to show is how potent that can be. And I'm going to return to the trap that I sketched the resource trap, and I'm going to show you how governance standards can make a big, big difference to that trap. Remember, the problem is that within the societies of the bottom billion, there are very powerful forces pushing to dismantle tech checks and balances or avoid them being built. And if those forces succeed, history is likely to repeat itself. And that history is that this huge opportunity is wasted. I'm firmly of the belief that change within the bottom billion basically has to come from within. The bottom billion will either develop themselves or not develop. It's not something that we can do for them. We can't tell them what policies to adopt. We can't just by pouring in money save them. This has to be a struggle won within the bottom billion. And struggles there are. In all these societies, the reformers fighting for change. And they have to be pretty courageous. One of my friends is the, the governor of an African central bank. 
Last year, he cleaned up his country's banking system, closed over 60 banks. In the process, he got 21 written death threats, not just against himself, against his little children. Eventually, it became so dangerous to leave his family in the country that his family are living in a little flat in London. Basically, they're exiles, whilst he tries to fight the battle of reform in his country. Those are the sort of struggles that in reality are going on. What can we do? What we can do is align ourselves with the forces for change. They're weak forces for change. They usually lose. And we can strengthen them. So I want to show how, in this case, interna international action on governance can strengthen the hand of the forces fighting for change. In transforming resource rents, resource wealth, into sustained growth, there are five key decision points. And I'll run through them very quickly. Each of these decision points could be the subject of a voluntary international standard. At the moment, none of them are the subject of any sort of international standard. It will be a simple matter to promulgate a voluntary standard. Once I've gone through the five, I'm going to show you the evidence that says even voluntary standards can be pretty potent. So what are the five decision points? Decision point one is how the government sells the rights to the resource extraction. Do you know how the rights to resource extraction have been sold in the past? Just think, right? The director of some company flies in, has a meeting with the minister or the president, and they reach a mutually beneficial deal, right? Which is good for the com company and good for the minister, right? But not necessarily good for the country. In fact, sometimes it isn't even good for the minister because not only is there a lot of scope for corruption, there's a massive asymmetry in information. The companies can afford to hire the smartest and best informed people on earth and the governments have civil services which have already collapsed and can barely find their way out of a paper bag. And that's the negotiation. So even when all the actors are honest, the gulf in knowledge and information is enormous. How can we rectify that? It's very simple. It's called an auction. If you run an auction, you don't even need to know what the resources are worth. The value is revealed in the process of the auction. Now, the auction needs to be verified to make sure that it's up to proper standards of an auction. But if we replaced private deals with public auctions, we'd get rid of the corruption because they'd be transparent, and we'd get rid of the asymmetry of information because the auction would reveal the value. I persuaded the uh, president of Sierra Leone on the, the advantages of doing an auction uh, by the following story. Uh, and this was that of course, the most knowledgeable Ministry of Finance on Earth is our own dear Ministry of Finance here in Britain. Right? Uh, all, think of all those wonderful people trained in Oxford who then get hired in the British Treasury. Right? And so the British Treasury decided to sell some rights. It actually wasn't mineral rights. Mineral rights, they do auction. But the rights they decided to sell were third-generation mobile phone rights. The Treasury worked out what these rights would be worth using all its available talent and came up with the sum £2 billion. Pounds. So it looked around for somebody willing to pay £2 billion. Pounds. Sure enough, a company came along. They were just about to sign up when somebody else from Oxford got there and said, actually, this is not quite the right way to do it. You should try an auction. They did, 
And they sold the third generation mobile phone rights, not for £2 billion, but for £20 billion. So I put to the president of Sierra Leone that if the British Treasury could be out by a factor of 10, what was the Sierra Leone in the Ministry of Finance likely to be out by? The next day, he phoned the World Bank and said, I want, I want advice on how to do an auction. So that's, rule no, that's, that's code number one, standard number one. Voluntary standard, but say, sign up to do an auction. Step two is to say, how do you tax? How do you tax the, the minerals? And what's going on at the moment is sometimes truly extraordinary, the failure to tax. Sometimes that's due to corruption. Sometimes it's due to ignorance. I'll give you the example of the aptly named Democratic Republic of the Congo, where exports of minerals in 2006 was several hundred million dollars and royalty payments into the Ministry of Finance of the Democratic Republic of the Congo were $86,000. Yeah? The sheer scale of the, of the mismanagement and the mistakes is staggering. Yeah? And so standard number two will be some advice on what sort of tax regime mineral extraction should be subject to. Standard number three would concern roughly how much you should save out of the revenues that are being generated. The rate of savings should depend upon how long the, the extraction is going to last. Are these resources going to deplete in five years or 50 years? And it should depend upon whether you think the world price is very high relative to the long term or very low. But at the moment, there are just breathtaking variation in savings rates unrelated to these features, and sometimes zero savings rates. There's a great tendency in these countries to throw a party. I was just in Ghana and Uganda, both of which have just discovered oil. And uh, the, the initial reaction of the society was, yes! <laughs> huh? And there needs to be some voices within the society that can counter that and say, that's what Nigeria did. Right? It threw a party. It was great whilst it lasted. And now they're sweeping up the glass. Not throwing a party means saving some of the money. The fourth and fifth codes concerns what you do with the savings. And you need to invest them. You need to invest them sensibly. In fact, there are, there are two things you've got to do. You've got to invest honestly. You've got to invest wisely. And they're very different. Right? Honesty is fundamentally about procedures things like pro pro competitive tendering in public procurement. Whilst investing wisely is about doing estimates of the likely rate of return on projects and protecting the technocrats who do those calculations from the political pressures to cheat on the, on the calculations. And so those could be a further two standards. So that's the waterfront. If you do all those five things, you harness these resources booms for sustained growth. If you get those five wrong, you're back in poverty. Yesterday, somebody in Zambia said to me, I'm terrified. If we get this wrong, this copper boom wrong, and then we run out of copper, what are our chances? We're landlocked, we're dirt poor, we've no opportunities. Now, can voluntary standards on these critical decisions help at all? Will people just ignore them? No. There, there are very obvious reasons why some international standards actually help reformers. First of all, reformers are only human, and so they tend 
often not to agree with each other. Right? If we're both reformers and I have an idea, you might say, wow, Paul, that's a really good idea. Or you might say, well, what about my idea? Right? And having some international standards gives us something that we can in common rally round without it being personalized. By depersonalizing it, it also makes it much more likely that once these standards are introduced, they will persist. One of my friends, Ngozi and Kondrowiala, introduced a savings rule in Nigeria. It's the Ngozi rule. She's, she only survived as finance minister for three years. She's not there anymore. Will the Ngozi rule survive? Let's hope so. Right? But if it had been an international standard instead of just the Ngozi rule, it would have been easier for the reformers within the society to try and protect it. In fact, we've got one really good example of an international standard, a voluntary standard, which has worked and that's the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. That came from nowhere. In fact, it came from a little British NGO of just 30 people, an organization called Global Witness. And those 30 people started a campaign to have a very simple international standard, basically that governments should reveal what revenues they were getting, reveal to their own citizens. Huh? Transparency and revenues. I mean, that's a very, very modest requirement. Right? Until that standard was put out, very few resource-rich developing countries actually told their citizens what the revenues were. But once that standard was put out as a voluntary international standard, it was seized upon by reformers. For example, it was seized upon by reformers in Nigeria who said, we're going to do that here. They did it. They actually published in the newspapers the money that was coming in and the money that was being distributed to the state governors. The day that they published that information in the newspapers, Nigerian newspaper circulation spiked to an all-time high because citizens wanted to know what was happening to their money. So, there's an example. And in fact, the EITI, although it's very, still very new, has now got a lot of governments that have signed up for it. In fact, it sorts the sheep out from the goats. The decent governments sign up, and that then reveals the ones that refuse to sign up as, as just what they are. So, there's an example of how you can use voluntary international standards to empower reformers within a society. The astounding thing is that although this is the biggest single phenomenon that is happening to the bottom billion, these resource spoons, their biggest single opportunity, and although the costs of promulgating those five international standards will be effectively zero, not one of those standards currently exists. And the developed world just keeps on missing opportunities to promulgate them. The only one that does exist is EITI, and that came out of 30 people in an NGO. I tried to get those standards promulgated in the last G8. I kept flying to Berlin and trying to get these ideas adopted. And I realized that politicians were basically kind of deaf to what I was saying, or or rather, that they were distracted. That politicians were using policy towards developing countries and policy towards the bottom billion as gesture politics. They were using it as an opportunity to pin a badge on themselves saying, look how much I care. Right? You fly to Africa, you kiss a baby with a lot of cameras, and you fly back home. And you announce a billion more of aid, which of course never arrives. Right? That's the game we're in. And I realized that why are politicians doing that? It's not even that they're stupid. It's that they're imprisoned. 
they're imprisoned by their voters. A lot of voters don't care about the bottom billion. And those that do care are missing four. The ones that care think it's all about aid. And some of it is, but most of it isn't. That's why I wrote a book that you can all read. Because it's important, I realized, to reach out and change the opinion of citizens. That way, we break politicians out of their prison. That's why I wrote The Bottom Billion. Thank you very much. Thank you.